Chapter 7, Educations, May through June, 1905. The page starts on page 145. The next day was much like every day for me during our stay among the demons. I got up just before dawn and got the fire going in the stove and put water on to boil and cooked our morning rice. I would help father with his handyman chores in certain of, in, in certain of Mr. Alger's buildings that were in safe areas. Father said it ought to be all right to do my shopping any time from the morning to the early afternoon because there were mostly harmless shoppers on the streets then. But I had to be back at the stable before the demon children got out of school. I was also to avoid any demons or demonesses standing about in large groups talking idly. I followed father's orders faithfully. I had no desire to get beaten up or strung from a lamppost by my hair. In the evening, after I had cooked dinner and washed up, there would be lessons in reading and writing the tame people's words and in the use of the abacus for arithmetic. I lived my life like that every day except for the demon's seventh day Sunday. As you can see, this didn't leave me much time to follow my original program of re-educating the demoness about dragons. But despite everything, father made it a point to let me have half an hour free each day. I could do anything I wanted during that time, spit at the walls, sleep on my mat, or simply go off on my own. I think father was secretly pleased when, a few days after we moved in, I decided to use this time to pay another visit to the demoness. I don't mean to make myself sound like a goody-goody, she was a demoness at, to me at that time who lived in a magical kind of lair. It was an adventure. It was a challenge. And if I could remind her of some of the true things about dragons that people ought to know, but that she seemed to have forgotten, well, that was to the good. I went up to the demoness's house in my clean tunic and pants. My boots shined and my face scrubbed and my charm around my neck. She smiled quietly and prettily as she had that first day. Why well, come in? moon shadow. Miss Whitlaw stood away from the door. Would you like some cookies and milk? Maybe cookies and tea? I asked. I held up the small package I brought. It was a jasmine type tea that is sweet and light and fragrant. On the cover was a dragon. Oh, how nice, the demoness said. But really, we don't need it. I have tea. Father had warned me that demons sometimes do not have a feeling for the proprieties. It's always good on the first visit to bring a little something to drink or eat. If father hadn't explained that to me carefully, I might have been offended by the demoness's refusal, because I might have mistaken her statement as saying that my, my gift was too cheap for her to use. I fumbled around for some excuse. Please, I drink a lot, too much. You take tea. I thrust it out at her once again. With a soft laugh, the demoness took it and lifted the lid. Why, there are flowers inside. She put water on to boil and then sat down across from me and picked at the tea until she could hold up one of the small, white, delicate blossoms. Isn't that a lovely idea? Flowers in your tea. She got up and returned with a small white thingamabob that had thickened cow's milk in it. Thickened yet. And had an oily kind of smell that nearly made me sick. She also set down a sugar bowl. Cream and sugar, moon shadow? Oh, but you never put that into it. She stood with the sugar bowl in her hand. You don't? No, no, it ruined tea. I will say this for the demoness. She was much more open to suggestion than I was. She put the sugar bowl and the ugh, cream jar away despite her misgivings. But after we had brewed the tea in the teapot, she sniffed at the spout appreciatively. Mmm, but this does smell nice. And she poured out two cups of the amber liquid. She sipped it tentatively. I watched her face as she broke into a smile and drank more. At least I had broken her of putting cream and sugar into everything. We drank out our tea in a friendly kind of silence and then Miss Whitlaw picked up the box again. Her fingers traced the long sinuous curves of the golden dragon. Oh my, isn't it a, it sounded like beautiful dragon. Please, beautiful, she repeated and explained the word to me. Once I understood her, I shook my head vehemently. No, no, it's a... I fumbled for the right word in the demon language, but all I could come up with was a dragony dragon. Another thing to say for the demoness was her genuine interest in learning about people as people. Where some idiot like myself would have been smug and patronizing, the demoness really wanted to learn. 
and like father, she was not afraid to talk to me like an equal. I don't think I understand. Dragon do terrible thing, yes, I said, struggling for the right words. But dragon, they do good thing too, bring rain for crops. They king among all, all reptile, the emperor of all animals, and so on. I went on to tell the demoness everything my father had told me about dragons. Why, how marvelous, the demoness exclaimed when I was finished. I never knew dragons did so much. Maybe only bad kind go live here. You know, outlaw, that respectable dragon no want. Why, yes, the demoness nodded. That would make sense. All the dragons I've read about haven't been very pleasant creatures. No dragon pleasant. A dragon, dragony. At that moment, someone knocked on the door. I looked up at the clock on the demoness's cabinet. I had spent over an hour here. That my father, I said, frightened. He looked for me. It was my fault, so don't worry. She added something that sounded like Tia. Please? The demoness looked embarrassed. I said, dear, it means a friend or someone who's close to you. She smoothed out a wrinkle at the, in the tablecloth. Perhaps I was too forward. No, no, it all right, I said. I felt sure now that I had known the demoness Miss Whitlaw in some other life. Why, thank you, she said. The knock came again more insistently this time. Miss Whitlaw opened the door. Hello, Mr. Lee, Moonshot and I were just talking. That boy can talk too much, father said sternly. No, no, it was my fault, I'm afraid. I kept your boy here listening to the wanderings of an old lady. You too kind, father said. On the contrary, you're too kind for loaning your son to me for all this time. Miss Whitlaw laughed pleasantly. When you get old, you get very selfish. Here I've kept Moonshadow for so long and it's nearly three. I didn't even give a thought to getting dinner for my boarders either. Miss Whitlaw had five boarders in her house. Each slept in his or her own room, but all of them ate at the dinner table with Miss Whitlaw. I only saw them once or twice because the demons and demonesses were so old that they kept to themselves. Father and I excused ourselves then and left. I had begun to think that the demons were not really so bad, but that very evening I found out that there can be some bad demons too. I was taking the trash out to the trash barrels when I saw a demon boy lounging against the wall of our alley. I was to find out later that he lived in the tenement house next door. He was about two or three years older than I was, and he was dressed in a gray shirt without a collar. The shirt was of a good, if rough, material. His hair was brown and his face was covered with brown spots. Freckles, Robin told me later. I passed by him when he kicked me in the backs of my legs. I fell on my back, cracking my head against the ground, the breath driven out of me. Our garbage pail spilled out all over the alley. The boy leered down at me and above me, on the back landing of the tenement house next door, I saw a half dozen boys begin to shout. I jumped to my feet and made the mistake of trying to express my anger in the demon tongue. All I could come up with was, I know like you. The boys fell over one another laughing. You know like me? The boy asked mockingly. I know like you. In my frustration, I began to curse him in the Tang people's language, using some of Uncle's more memorable curses. I'm going to cut off your head, I told him, and leave it in the gutter for the dogs to eat. I went on from there, embroidered on the scene, embroidering on the scene, but the boy shinned over the fence while the boys above him began to make mock Tang people sounds. Sounds like wing duck so long and woon hop long hop in rising and falling voices. I could have bitten off my tongue but I stood there staring at them, not wanting to let them chase me away. I felt something soft and wet hit my leg. It was an old tomato. They began to throw bits and pieces of garbage at me. Still, I stood there. Finally, stones began falling around me. I suppose they had collected the garbage and stones before they tried to get me. I felt a vague feeling of triumph at having made them use their biggest weapons. I turned slowly as if I were not afraid of them, but only bored. A stone caught me in the small of my back. I grunted, but I took my time despite the pain, remembering how Red Rabbit had behaved the other time. Besides, I did not want to give them the satisfaction of seeing me cry. I didn't tell father about the demon boys. He might have become worried and insisted that we go back to live among our own people, even if it meant swallowing his pride and settling up with the sleepers. 
The next day I tried to go with father, but he said he was going into a rougher area that day. So I spent the whole time inside the stable. The demon boys must have played hooky that day. Every now and then I would hear them chant something and sometimes rocks would thud against the walls. I did my best to go on with my chores and lessons, but it was hard. It didn't help my state of mind when father came home that evening with a black eye and his right sleeve torn. He set down his toolbox and pointed a finger at me. Before you ask any questions, I'll just say that I got the best of a fight with two demons. They ambushed me inside one of Mr. Alger's buildings. I suppose they thought they could rob me. I went out and got some water for father to wash up. Did they? I asked. Father grinned. What do you think? During the next demon week, the nighttime was especially bad for me. I would imagine that every sound was made by demons or ghosts gathering in the dark to whisper by the door while they waited to pounce on me. It got so that I was afraid at night to go outside to the pump in the backyard because I was afraid the demons might be attracted by the sound of splishing, splashing water. But I had to wash the dishes, so I would dash out to the pump. With my heart re beating fast, I would prime the handle frantically and then run back to the shed as fast as I could, spilling half the water on the way. It was the demon girl who started to wash her dishes outside for the fresh air instead of inside the kitchen at the indoor pump. Though I trusted Miss Whitlaw, I was not so sure about the demon girl. With her flaming red hair, she seemed like a true fox demoness who would delight in tricking humans. Maybe she was just curious about why I rushed back and forth to the pump, but I still was not too sure about the demon girl, and I had heard about fox demonesses luring humans to their deaths. I stayed inside. Finally, the demon girl filled a bucket of water and pointed in my direction, meaning it was for me. I suppose she knew I was watching her from inside the stable, but the next day the demon girl was on the back porch peeling potatoes, and after that she peeled some apples. And after that, she peeled some onions. She was laying siege to me. She stayed out there for most of the day until I just had to make a trip to the outhouse. When I came out, I tried to walk back, to walk quickly back to our stable, but she dashed down the steps and got in front of me. Why are you so scared of the pump? She demanded. I shrugged silently. I trusted Miss Whitlaw not to make fun of my demon talk, but not anyone else. But it's stupid, the demon girl persisted. You lose half the water your way. The demon girl pulled one of her pigtails over her shoulder in front of her so she could study in its tip. Are all Chinamen crazy like you? The kitchen door opened suddenly. You, Robin, Miss Whitlaw said sternly. I told you to leave Moonshadow alone. But I'm just trying to be friendly with him, but he won't talk to me, protested Robin. Miss Whitlaw leaned over and spoke gently. How would you feel if you were plunked right down in China in a small village with those almost no hope of going back? Wouldn't you be scared? Well, yes, the demon girl admitted reluctantly. Then she looked at me. But I'd listened to some Chinamen who told me there wasn't anything in the village pump or anything near it that could hurt me. She walked back to the steps and picked up her bucket of potatoes and went inside. Miss Whitlow stood helplessly by the door. I'm sorry, Moonshadow. It's all right. I said. My cheeks were red with embarrassment. That night, I made myself join the demon girl by the pump to do the dishes. I had to prove to her I was not scared, but I still would not speak to her, and I wore the charm against demons. No sense in taking any extra risk. It was about two demon weeks after the water pump incident. The city had steady spring rains every day, but I didn't mind. The demon boys stayed inside if they were around at all. Though father was not at home, I had company enough, for the rains here were lively, friendly things. The strong winds would blow in from the sea and catch the rain so that you never knew from what direction it would hit. Sometimes it would drown suddenly on the roof. The next moment, the roof would be silent as the rain rattled against the glass on one wall. Then the rain would jump and tap at the window on the opposite side. During this time, father lined up extra repair jobs, clocks and things to fix in his spare time, until his table was cluttered. Still, he spared a half hour every evening to read to me from his aeronautical books. I don't think he ever stopped to consider that the Wrights were about the only demons to whom I would have talked for any long period of time. And after the half hour lesson would come the reward, when we would work at a model of a glider, imitating the pictures and schematics in the books. 
father would set the problem of ratios to me in which I would have to convert the figures for a full length original to a scaled down model. Between my head and the abacus, I managed. Then father and I would cut the bamboo strips and the rice paper and slowly construct the model. But we never got a chance to fly it because whenever father was free, it was rainy. So came his first free day when the skies, though still cloudly, didn't look like rain. Father announced we were flying it even though we had to wear boots and heavy coats. In those days, San Francisco had not been built up as much, and if we walked about a mile to the west, we'd find plenty of open sand dunes for several miles until we hit the ocean. I might have known the demon girl would tag along. She walked behind us, pretending to be interested in various houses and gardens that just happened to lie along the way we were taking. Finally, after this had gone on for three blocks, Father turned. You want to help us fly it? He held up the model glider. It was a good three feet in wingspan. The demon girl shrugged. I guess so. I said nothing to her. I felt betrayed by father, and I was hurt too that father spent most of the time talking to the demon girl. He was only being polite, but I didn't see it that way. I kept waiting for her to make fun of the way he talked, but she never did. I've never seen a kite like that, she said finally. This model of glider take man in disguise, father said. Oh, go on, the demon girl shook her head. I wasn't born yesterday. No, you may be born 10 years ago, father said matter-of-factly and was puzzled when the demon girl sniffed and her back stiffened. She was awfully touchy about people being smart with her and she thought father was being smart right then. He was only stating a fact though, as he understood it. But the demon girl warmed up when he began to fly the glider. Father had me run with it while he jotted down notes with a well-worn stub of a pencil on some of our old bills. The glider behaved erratically, dipping and then soaring and then dipping again. Then father waved me back to him. When I got there, we pulled in the glider. It came down too quickly, but father ran and caught it. Then he turned the glider model over in his hands. I took some more scraps of paper with clean backs out of his pocket. It was my turn to take notes and also get some writing practice in demonic. It needed more wing surface, father mused. And he went into a lot of jargon about center of gravity and wing configuration. Wing what? The demon girl asked. Father glanced at me. It was my turn to show off. Wing configuration. You know, shape of wing. I traced the shape of the wing with my pencil. I waited for her to make fun of me. Oh, was all the demon girl said. She crossed her arms. For someone who doesn't know English too well, you will know an awful lot of four-bit words. They in the books, I said cautiously. Books? The demon girl asked. She picked up interest. We shook father said politely. When we returned to our stable, we gave the demon girl one, our one good chair, an old stool that father had found in a vacated apartment in which we had stripped of paint and repainted. She sat down before our bookcase, several fruit crates turned on their sides. She paged through the books, looking more and more puzzled. You understand this? She asked. Yes, some, I said. Father nudged me and I stood beside her, explaining what I could in my broken demonic. In the meantime, father left to buy some vegetables for a nearby greengrocer for our dinner. The demon girl closed the book when I finished explaining the paragraphs and she leaned forward, her body following the line of books. But where's the dragon book? What dragon book? The one that you get all those stories about dragons from? Or did you just make up those things you told to my aunt? I say true things about dragons bringing rain to men and about their being able to shave, change their size and shape. The demon girl looked skeptical. They true, I answered. The demon girl pursed her lips. In China, in the whole world, you Americans not know everything. The demon girl considered that for a moment as she picked up the lint on her pocket. I suppose, she said grudgingly, but then you don't know everything either. That was true, but I didn't much like admitting it. Instead, I shrugged, but I know lots about dragons. You like dragons? I don't know. I never met one. She said that almost as a dare to me, but I didn't back down. How you know? They can be tiny, tiny as a fleet. Maybe you hear a voice speak to you from somewhere, from nowhere. That's them as tiny, tiny as ant. Only you know see. Or maybe take shape of men. The demon girl crossed her arms over her chest and leaned forward on her knees. Huh. She still looked doubtful. I couldn't understand her stubbornness and refusing to believe in dragons. I suppose for her part, she couldn't understand why I believed in them. She added, I'm from... It sounded like Missouri. Please? She spoke very slowly. Missouri. It's a state. 
Is that like province? I guess. What I mean is that I'm as stubborn as a Missouri mule. Please. As my aunt says, it's a creature that pound for pound can out ornery any other creature on God's earth. How you know true? I never seen one. Sure you have. There are lots of mules. But you know if any come from Missouri? I guess so. How you know? I asked triumphantly. The demon girl made a small, exasperated sound. She mulled that over for a while, chewing at her underlip. You're a clever, slippery creature, Moonshadow, she grudged finally. I'll give you that much. You turn the tables around nice and neat. She glanced at me sideways and smiled again. And as for telling whoppers, there probably never was your like. You tell some mean stories about dragons. Whoppers? Mean stories? Oh, never mind. The demon girl slid the book back onto the shelf. But I'd swear you have an imagination almost as good as E. Nesbitt. Who's that? A new writer. And she made me wait until she got some books from her room. They looked very interesting, but to my embarrassment, I found that I had spent so much time learning aeronautical jargon, I hadn't picked up on everyday talk. Still, I could look at the pictures while the demon girl outlined the story about flying carpets and phoenixes and magic amulets and cranky old sand elves who lived on beaches. She explained that a cousin of her father's lived now in England and shipped them here. I've got some of these, too, the demon girl pretended to say casually. She slipped some dime novels from behind her back. They were printed on cheap tan-colored paper with the most lurid paper covers, and they ranged across a wide variety of subjects. There were Ned Butlin specials about the adventures of Buffalo Bill in the wild, wild west. To me, it was the east, though, since I judged things geographically in relation to the Middle Kingdom. There were others about Jesse James and how he tormented his robbery victims. But her pride and joy were the Nick Carter detective stories, with a dead body on almost every page, as she boasted. Your cousin send these? She laughed. Oh, no. I got these from Macy next door. She's a girl in my class at school. and She got them from her brother, Jack. We trade back and forth, but she leaned forward conspiratorially. You can't tell Auntie. She'd have kittens if she found out. She would? I said with interest. No, no, it was only a figure of speech. I'd get in trouble if she knew I was reading these she said. I realized then that the demon girl, Robin, was testing me. Well, she was not all that bad to talk to, and she at least had never thrown a rock at me. I know, Tal, I said. She sat back, satisfied. You can read them, if you like. I like to, but I don't think I can. Too many words I not know, I confessed. I'll teach you, Robin said loftily. She put her hand on the stack of E. Nesbitt books. We'll start with these. And then when you know English better, you can read these. She touched her precious pile of dime novels. And that was how my lesson started. Father gave me permission to go over to Miss Whitlaw's for an hour to read with Robin and write. Miss Whitlaw sat in the parlor and helped me too. My vocabulary and grammar picked up enough so that I could stumble through the E. Nesbitt books. And I found that the dime novels were easier stuff because they had simple words and ideas. Robin was right. They were great. A wash with gore, she liked to say. And even after I had finished the Nesbitt books, we continued my lessons. We would talk about any number of things, and Miss Whitlaw encouraged me to write short paragraphs about dragons, which she and Robin then corrected. Robin, of course, said she didn't believe one word of what I wrote or said about dragons. She would simply sniff or roll her eyes or shake her head at another whopper. But she was always there in the parlor every night, munching away at cookies and listening to what I said or reading what I wrote about dragons or I went on to tell them of the adventures of the dragons near my village, of their feuds and wars, of the love affairs between men and dragon maidens who would take a human form, and of the friendships that had helped me. In the weeks that followed, I found out that while I had set out to re-educate the demoness about dragons, she was educating me in the demonic language. After a while, we wandered away from the dragons, for to explain about the dragons, I had to describe my home, I mean, our home. In very halting demonic, I told them about the waters of the Pearl River, thick and milky and colored a reddish yellow, like the color of sunset distilled from the air. On the river, you might see a stately junk tottering its way upstream, slatted sails rising to meet the wind, and skittering all around them would be the small two men fishing boats, like little water bugs skimming over the surface. Sometimes they sailed in pairs before the wind with a net between them, scooping up the fish. Their square sails danced before the wind like sheets of paper. All this Miss Whitlaw listened to and more. 
oh, someone else might say that she was simply interested in a foreign country. But I was convinced that she hung on to my words because she had been a Tang woman in a former life and better life. But if things were going great for me, I could not say the same about father. There was so much to learn about the airplane. There were tables and charts he needed for various things, like the ratio between the curvature of the propeller blades and the revolutions they produced. It was then that I got an idea. I waited until Robin was in school and father was away on an errand before I went to see Miss Willow. You help me write letter, maybe? I asked her. Why, of course, Moonshadow. To whom are you writing? To the rights, I announced proudly. The aeronaut. Miss Whitlaw seemed impressed. Oh, yes, I've read all about their exploits, and if half of what they say is true, why, it must be marvelous. But why do you ever want to write to them? My father, I began cautiously, he wants to fly like writers. Miss Whitlaw put a hand to her mouth. Oh, my, isn't that rather dangerous? I shrugged. Not if he know how. Does he? Yes and no, I said. I did not think Miss Whitlock could be told about my dream, but he needs facts, numbers, to build airplanes. Robin told me he made such marvelous glider models, but I had no idea it was only a preliminary to have such ambition. Miss Whitlock shook her head in admiration, and I think also a little anxiously. You help me write them? Yes. Do you have their address? When she saw my puzzled look, she explained the demon's postal system. I know village, no, the town they live in, and, and province, no state. Well, she said, it might get through with just that. With her help, I finally wrote something like this. To the honorable rights, this is to inform you that I am a boy of 11. I have greatly admired your feats of daring. My father wants to fly too. Can you help him? We need to know how to shape the propellers. We need to know how big the wings should be in order to lift my father into the air. Father says that no one else in the world knows as much as you do about airplanes. Thank you. And I signed it with the sounds of my name spelled out in demon letters. I wrote several drafts of it and then copied it out in the fine, elegant hand Miss Whitlaw had taught me. The next day, we went down together and mailed the letter. You realize, though, Moonshadow, that even if they are to get this letter, there's no guarantee that they'll answer it. They're busy men, you know. But two weeks later, I got a letter from the Wright's Bicycle Shop, and in a very neat, strong hand, Orville entered me. Dear Mr. Lee, my brother and I are always happy to meet another flying enthusiast. Our brotherhood is too small to lose any one of us. Enclosed, you will find some tables and diagrams that should prove to some, of some service to you. And if we can be of any further assistance, please let us know. I waited anxiously that whole afternoon until Father came home. I almost danced around him. He hung his hat up on a nail and grinned. What is it you want to tell me? Did someone die and leave us a fortune? Better than that. I held up the letter. I can't read that kind of demon script. Father handed the letter back to me. He could only read, read demon printed letters. He sat down on a crate while I read the letter to him. When I finished, I found him staring at me. I couldn't tell if he was angry or what. They also sent us some tables and diagrams. I tried to show them to father, but he wouldn't look at them. Did I do wrong? I asked just that but it seems like begging father said but miss whitlaw miss whitlaw father asked sharply did you ask her to write the letter she only helped i set the tables and diagrams down on top of a nearby crate you told her about my dream father accused me no i said quickly i was scared you talk too much father snapped father crumpled up the letter and threw it in a corner i left father sitting at the table Miss Whitlaw and Robin were in the kitchen baking some things, but Miss Whitlaw took one look at my face and told Robin to leave the room. Then she sat me down at the table and took my hand. What is it, Moon Shadow? I told Miss Whitlaw about Father's being mad, and I hinted a little about how he behaved like a dragon sometimes, but Miss Whitlaw didn't not laugh. Perhaps, Miss Whitlaw tapped a finger against her lips for a moment. Perhaps the truth of the dragon lies somewhere in between the American and Chinese versions. He's neither all bad nor all good, neither all destructive nor all kind. He's a creature particularly in tune with nature, and so, like nature, he can be very, very kind or very, very terrible. If you love him, you'll accept what he is. Otherwise, he'll destroy you. For a long time, I listened in silence to the steady ticking of our kitchen clock. 
You're a wise woman, I said finally. No, she laughed. Just a foolish old woman who talks so much that every now and then she gets lucky and says the truth. She patted me on the shoulder. Now go back to him. I went back. Rather than shout at me, father had gone to sleep. The next morning, I found that father had picked up the letter and smoothed it out on the table as best he could. At that moment, he was leafing through the table and diagram. He turned around when he heard me get up. Still, there's so much to know. And they did call us brothers. Yes, they did, I said carefully. Father shook the tin can into which we put our savings. He pulled out some demon paper called dollars and coins. Maybe they'd like a crate of oranges. Don't you want to write a letter to them? Yes, I guess that would be best. Can you write while I dictate? I can try. Father thought for a moment. Maybe you should get Miss Whitlock to look at the final version, Father suggested. He wagged a finger at me, but only for the grammar, 